Hi, thank you for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today we will study what the Apostle Paul had to say to the church in Corinth regarding marriage and intimacy. The message comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 9, and the Life Notes are available to download from calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. This topic is mature and may not be suitable for young children. Now, here's Pastor Chad Garrison. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 7 is our text, and uh, if you're... Uh, in one of our campuses and you don't have a Bible, that's perfectly fine. Uh, If you're at our Sweetwater location, you can just grab a Bible in the seats around you. If you're at our Parker campus, then there's a table in the back. Just get up right now and go grab a Bible and then turn to page 1135 and you'll be able to follow along with us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If uh, you're in any of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one. It is our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, message us. We will get you a Bible. We want everyone to have God's Word and read God's Word because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, I just got to echo what uh, Pastor Robert said about school starting and about us loving teachers. And so make sure that you guys tell your teacher friends all about the gift cards next weekend. Uh, Yes, it's bribery. Yes, we don't care. Um, (laughs) Hey, we want to bless, and uh, it, they got to come to the building so we can hand them the thing. If, if you're, they're an educator, then we want to bless them. So just tell them we love them, and, uh, and they can come, and we get to bless them in person and say thank you for teaching our kids. Because let's face it, we all want bright, smart kids. Amen. Now, uh, speaking about, because you know, otherwise they grow up to be stupid adults, and none of us want that. <laughs> okay? Now, yeah, just on the point of schools, I got to say, you may or may not know that Calvary has its own school. We have Calvary Christian Academy, three-year-old kindergarten through eighth grade right now. We're talking about high school in the future. And, uh, and I just want to mention that because as school's getting closer, we've got this new law uh, that Arizona passed. And if you want to go to a private school and you always thought I can't afford it, then you can. There's a way to do that. You just need to contact the school and talk to them about that. And we still have openings. Last time I checked in all the grades, we have a few openings, even in preschool, which usually filled up. We've got openings. In, and I mentioned the preschool because I got grandkids in the preschool. And uh, if you want to get your uh, kids or grandkids off to a great academic start, uh, I'm just going to plug our preschool because they don't just like play with kids. They teach them so they're reading by the time they get to kindergarten. And uh, I just want to encourage you, if that's something that you have a need for, then uh, you might want to check it out and uh, call them on Monday morning and talk to them about space. So uh, that said, let's dive into 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The church at Corinth was a mess. Uh, If you've been with us for this series, you know that by now. I mean, they were fighting and vying for power. They were arrogant. They were allowing uh, gross sexual sin to be normalized in the church. They were suing each other in court, and they were uh, fighting sexual temptation, but not very well. And in the midst of this mess, the Apostle Paul tries to promote and encourage biblical marriage. So he talks about, in chapter 7, marriage and singleness and divorce and all those things. So this week we're going to discuss marriage and intimacy. Next week, divorce and what the Bible says. So I hope you'll hang around for all of it. Uh, You know, a lot of churches may avoid those subjects. That's why when you preach through a book of the Bible, you can't avoid anything. uh, Or else people go, why'd you skip this part? Uh, Because we don't want to talk about it? Well, too bad. We're going to talk about it. And that's why we give you the warning. Uh, Not because we want your kids in the, in shock. By the way, our our children's ministry is incredible. So yes, we want your kids there. But uh, we also want you to be aware. We don't want to surprise you and uh, and create uh, a difficult week for you with the kids. So uh, anyway, hey, let me give you a little background about Corinth. Something you may or may not know. Corinth was, uh, as one scholar put it, the most licentious city in the Roman Empire. Uh, it, it was a place full of uh, lust, and part of the reason was uh, Temple of Aphrodite was located in Corinth, and there just wasn't one, just one temple. There were offshoots of the temples and different things like that, and people would come from all over the world. It was a place of, of trade to worship. Uh, how, did, how did they worship? Well, Aphrodite is a goddess of love, and so they had a, a thousand temple prostitutes that were available for you to go and worship with. They did not have a problem getting men to worship. Uh, So, just saying. Uh, And so, this was the background 
of which Paul had written the sermon from last week where he's talking about, hey, the body isn't for immorality, it's for God. You are not your own, you're bought with a price. And, and why Paul was challenging the Corinthian Christians to live different. And, and he's continuing that thought as he talks about uh, immorality and the context of marriage. Now, before I read uh, the first nine verses of 1 Corinthians 7, let me just remind you, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church. He's writing to believers in Jesus Christ. So if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and if you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, what the Apostle Paul is saying applies to you. Okay, you've already said, Jesus is my Lord. He's my Savior. Just like this young man declared his faith in Christ in baptism, you've already said, I'm following Jesus. Okay, so that's settled. So then everything that scripture has to teach you, it, you've already said, I'm a, uh, this is what I'm gonna do. Okay, now you may wrestle with that, which hopefully you will. You may not like it, which is perfectly fine. But the question isn't whether we like it. The question is whether we obey it. Now, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, we're glad you're here, listen in. But guess what? None of these standards that we're talking about apply to you. They apply to followers of Jesus Christ. Now, we want you to become a follower of Jesus Christ. We want you to place your faith and trust in Jesus because he's the only one who can forgive your sins and give you eternal life. But, um, but here's the thing, the, the things we're talking about, they're not universal, they're for followers of Jesus. Paul is not addressing the people who live in Corinth who aren't followers of Jesus, he's addressing the followers of Christ. So as we read this, uh, just understand who it applies to, and, and then we'll talk about what he's conveying. Now Paul says, concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. He's, he's promoting chastity, and he's uh, promoting uh, lifelong commitment, you know, kind of like the priesthood. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as myself, I myself am, but each one has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now, the Apostle Paul is pretty blunt, He's definitely not being romantic. He's being very practical, but I want to I want to read this. I want to reread part of this passage with basically an emphasis on what Paul is saying to those who are married. Okay? Beginning in verse 2, he says, "But because of the, of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, have sex. And likewise, the wife to her husband have sex." For the wife does not have authority over her own body, have sex, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does, have sex. Do not deprive one another, have sex, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, have sex. But then come together again, have sex, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And all the men in the room said, Amen. Look, got to listen to the whole sermon, guys. Not just that part. Look, the apostle was not trying at all to be romantic here. Um, and because, I mean, he says, I wish you guys could all stay single. I wish you had the kind of self control that this sin, this attraction, this thing did not own you, but since you can't, uh, and he's not being risque, by the way, he's offering practical wisdom to protect Christians from temptation and self-destruction. Okay, that, that's what he's offering. So I want to begin 
with Paul's encouragement. And I want us to talk about marriage and intimacy uh, out of this uh, passage where he's so clearly uh, com communicating to us. So the first thing I want you to know is that God created sex to bless us. God created sex to bless us. Genesis chapter two, in paradise, God creates man he cre and he says, oh, everything's perfect, everything's good. And then he goes, it's not good that the man should be alone. And basically, God's pronouncement is that when men are alone, they're pathetic. <laughs> so I need to create a helper for him because he's an idiot. And uh, so God created woman to be with man. I mean, this is part of creation's design. And we were designed by God to be sexual people, male and female, he created them. Not an option, by the way. So I just want you to know, sex is not a taboo subject that we shouldn't be talking about in church. Sex is a biblical subject. Uh, just by the way, I want you to think about this. Because a lot of times we go, okay, God created sex. You, you do realize God could have created us just about any way imaginable for us to reproduce. Okay, I mean, it, here's just one way that pops into my sick, twisted mind. What if God had made it so that um, all the guy's hair once a year blew off their head <laughs> and it floated around like pollen and if it landed on a woman's head, she got pregnant. <laughs> now you're laughing, but God could have made it that way. We would have all been like, guys, it's, uh, you know, you need to put a hairnet on as a condom. Uh, <laughs> Ladies, you need to wear hats as birth control. Uh, <laughs> now, see, that sounds ridiculous, and it is, but at the same time, God could have done that. He could have had you been walking down the street and just like suddenly split into two, and you're like, oh, there's a little mini-me. Hey, what do you know? And he didn't do that. He gave us this gift. Sex is God's idea from the very beginning. And God's plan is one man, one woman, one lifetime. That's the ideal. Now, because we fail at this, God redeems. And because some spouses are abusive or unfaithful or abandon their partners, God prescribed divorce and remarriage. Now, God hates divorce. We're gonna discuss this next week in detail because every divorce represents a broken family, but God redeems even through divorce. So, you know, his plan, one man, one woman, one, uh, for a lifetime. But why is that his plan? because intimacy grows out of a loving, faithful, committed relationship. Intimacy grows out of this loving, committed, faithful relationship. Over the years, a biblical marriage is designed to produce security, closeness, oneness. Physic it's oneness that is physical, that is emotional, that is social, that is relational, and is spiritual. That's God's design. And the idea is for spouses to bless each other by giving themselves only to the other. Now, to do that requires, you know, trust and vulnerability. But if you do that, it produces trust and intimacy. See, this type of marriage is how God blesses us in relational obedience. Because when we obey God, we find blessings at every step of the way. Okay? So God created sex to bless us. You guys got that? Now... Satan corrupts sex to destroy us. Satan corrupts sex to destroy us. So God gave us this good gift and Satan likes to just take it and, and turn it uh, into something twisted. And, and for those of you, by the way, who are thinking that you know, God's plan that we talked about is quaint and old fashioned or unrealistic, uh, realize please that Satan is your adversary. And Jesus said this, in John chapter 10, he said, the thief, talking about Satan, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly, have it to the full, have it overflowing. So, so God wants to bless you. Satan wants to destroy your life. So Satan takes these beautiful gifts that God gives us and he corrupts and perverts and twists them. And then he deceives us. He kind of sells it back to us with his goal of a comp, uh, to destroy people's lives and their families. Your life and your family that God loves and wants to bless. Satan wants to destroy you. Um, now, we know that our uh, pornography-driven, sex-saturated, hookup culture world is killing us. Literally, it's killing us. I want to point out three of the lies of Satan that 
that you may or may not uh, be aware of and the destruction that they're reaping on our lives. Uh, first of all, pornography is killing our libido. Uh, and guys, I really want you to hear this. I know that pornography is everywhere. So parents, if you've got kids at home, please, please, please put filters and control on your devices. All of the devices, even your kids' gaming systems, because those have online access and they can do porn through their gaming systems. If you think your kids aren't, then you're, you're playing naive. 11 years old is the average first exposure to hardcore pornography. Those statistics are a few years old. It's probably younger than that by now. 11 years old. Don't, don't just ignore it. You know, uh, control what your kid can see, please. Uh, for every dollar spent on professional sports in America, $3 are spent on pornography. That's how bad it is. The impact of pornography is just now being measured. Now, I went to uh, secular statistics and secular sources on this. I just want you to know this. This is not skewed, uh, you, know, uh, you know, some kind of faith thing trying to, to pump this up. This is National Institute of Health study. They say pornography is destructive. Uh, prior to widespread internet availability, Erectile dysfunction among men under 40. Yes, he's talking about erectile dysfunction from the pulpit. Go ahead. Some of you need to like text it right now and like go, I can't believe I'm in church. Okay. ED among men under 40 was less than 2% before the internet. Less than 2% before the internet. See, I should have you make bets with the people sitting next to you about what it is now for men under 40. But since the internet, uh, widespread use of the internet, between 20 and 30% of men under the age of 40 are struggling with ED. There is no other common reason for that. That's what pornography is doing to us. So guys, if you're struggling with a porn addiction and you want help, can I just tell you that Jesus can change your life? And if you'll let him, he'll not only change your life, but he'll restore your marriage. But you got to ask for help. You need to ask God to help you. And then you need to step into some kind of accountability relationship. Some kind of accountability relationship. Look, get involved in our men's ministry. We've got a lot of stories of victory over pornography addiction in our men's ministry. They will hold you accountable in a small group. Come to Celebrate Recovery on Monday night at 630. <laughs> They're not afraid to talk about it. They're not afraid of your struggles and they will help you overcome that because a lot of them have overcome pornography addictions. Um, if you want resources for home, okay, there's ministries uh, and you're gonna laugh at this, triplexchurch.com. <laughs> it is resources to help men fight pornography, men and women fight pornography addiction. It's filters and, and controls and accountability for your devices or go to covenanteyes.com. Covenant Eyes is the resource that we use as pastors of this church. All of us have Covenant Eyes on all of our devices for accountability. Now, just giving you resources and, and, and the ball is in your court, but don't let pornography kill your relationship. That's what Satan wants it to do. So pornography is killing our libido and sexually transmitted diseases are killing our bodies. Now, I got this information from the Centers for Disease Control, and I realized that their credibility has taken a hit these last couple of years. But uh, they consider STDs to be an epidemic in the United States of America. A few years ago, they reported that about 40% of the population has had an STD. It's four out of 10 people in America. The fastest growing age group is ages 15 to 24. Second fastest age group is senior adults. <laughs> yeah, all these old rebels. <laughs> we couldn't do that when I was a kid. Repent. Uh, so the damaging effects, about 20,000 women a year in the U.S. become infertile because of STDs. And here's the scary thing. Drug-resistant STDs are growing and spreading at an alarming rate. Pornography is killing our libido. STDs are killing our bodies. Hookup culture is killing relationships. Uh, look, we all know that smartphones have been killing conversation. I hate, sitting, I hate being in a restaurant and seeing two people sitting across from each other on their phones. But hookup apps have reduced courtship, romance, and relationship skills to swipe right. 
And Satan is selling it to you as freedom, as fun, as excitement. Right up until we realize our sexual freedom has become a prison of addiction and disease and disappointment and loneliness. Because we've taken God's beautiful gift and we've turned it into a recreational activity. See, God created sex to bless us. Satan corrupts sex in order to destroy us. Now, I'm assuming that most of you here, most of you joining us online, uh, most, of it are, most of you at our campuses want to live in God's blessings. Uh, most of you want to honor God in your marriage, in your family. But uh, let's face it, we've experienced abuse, corruption, deception, and betrayal along the way. Please know this. If you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this. God's grace abounds to you. God's grace is available to you no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you. God wants to heal you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to restore you. He wants to redeem your life. And he will if you just step into his grace. He does not want you to live with guilt or shame or any of that. He wants to offer you complete forgiveness. In fact, the Apostle John puts it beautifully in his first letter, chapter one. He says, if we confess our sin, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us our sin and purify us of all unrighteousness. Just like you'd never sinned. Just step into that grace. If you want a fresh start, it begins with our commitment to follow Jesus, to listen to his wisdom and allow God to redeem and restore our lives. That's our invitation to you. By the way, that's why if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, that's what we're inviting you into, a relationship of redemption, of forgiveness, of restoration, if you will commit your life to following Jesus, if you'll surrender to him. So I'm assuming that we want to live in God's blessings. Do you guys want to live in God's blessings? Yes. Okay. If you do, then let's discuss how to build healthy intimacy. How to build healthy intimacy. Uh, like, I'm just going to share with you four choices real briefly. Not, not gonna, like everyone could be a sermon. It's not going to be uh, today. Uh, but four choices that if you make these choices, then your intimacy and your relationship is going to grow. It's going to get healthier. And here's the thing. They're not choices you make once. They're choices you make over and over and over. They're choices you make every single day. Okay. So here they are. First of all, if you want to ha build healthy intimacy in your relationship, decide to delight. Decide to delight. Proverbs chapter five, verse 18 says, and, and by the way, Proverbs chapter five is all about avoiding immorality. And in the middle of it, he says, let your fountain be blessed. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Don't, he's saying, don't chase after all these others. Just rejoice in the wife of your youth. So how you see your spouse matters. I can't even overstate how important it is the way that you look at your spouse and the way you think about your spouse and the way you see them. So choose to see their, their attributes of blessing rather than fixating on their flaws. Like I know what temptation looks like when they're really irritating you and you can list all of the things that they do that drive you crazy, right? Yeah, I mean, you can name them out. You've got, some of you have written journals about these. Some of you just complain to your friends or your parents or, you know, online. You know, it, look, you, here's the thing. Be grateful, be affirming, be encouraging and ask God to help you love your spouse better, to delight in your spouse. Stop asking God to fix them. You know, that's what we do, right? God, would you please fix her? She's crazy. God, would you please fix him? And God's like, no, you're the problem. You can't control them, but you can control you. So if you will ask me to help you be a better husband, if you'll ask me to help you be a better wife, then I will help you to do that. So delight in your spouse. By the way, delighting in your spouse means choosing to love your spouse for who they are, not who you wish they were. Say, so stop thinking, well, if they would just do this differently, if they would just do that, then uh, no, repent. That's you. Decide to delight. Every day, decide to delight. And then secondly, communicate gently. If you want to build healthy intimacy, communicate gently. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 4, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, 
but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Do you catch that? I'll only speak words that build the other one up that it may give grace, mercy to those who hear. Hey, I, I just gotta ask you, don't answer out loud. You can repent later. Do your words give grace to your mate? Um, do you talk to them, you know, about positive things, about your day, about the details, about your experiences? Do you listen to them talk about their day and, or do you just critique and criticize? See, so often we talk to build ourselves up and put others down and Jesus calls us to reverse that. Build each other up. Build up your spouse with your words and watch your marriage blossom. That, that may be a huge change that, that you hadn't really thought about, but if you'll get serious about that, if you'll go, okay, God, help me to speak words of kindness instead of words of criticism, uh, you just watch the change that happens in your marriage over a couple of weeks. You'll be amazed. So uh, just talk to your spouse. Talk often and speak gently. It'll build trust, and that will build intimacy. So uh, communicate gently and forgive daily. Forgive every single day. Again, the Apostle Paul, Ephesians 4. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. By the way, in case you missed this, in Christ God forgave you of everything. Of everything, every sin, every brokenness, God forgave you of all of it. He's saying, look, be kind to your spouse. You know, be compassionate toward your spouse and forgive your spouse. Um, anger and resentment destroy intimacy. I'm gonna say that again, because some of you need to hear it. Anger and resentment destroy intimacy. And if you're married, you know your spouse can annoy you or anger you faster than anybody else on the face of the earth. Right? Nobody's saying amen now. It's like, I can't answer. They're sitting next to me. Look, it's just true. You live in close quarters. You know each other really well. It's easy to get annoyed or get angry with your spouse. Here's the thing. Forgiveness empties the anger trash. Okay, look, when, whenever you hold a grudge, whenever you, uh, you know, are unforgiving towards someone, little things, big things, doesn't matter. It, it's like, you know, throwing that uh, old nasty stuff out of the fridge in the trash can and not taking it out. You can get away with that for a few hours, but in a day, your house stinks. And when you refuse to forgive your spouse, your marriage stinks. It just does. You need to empty that trash can of anger. And the only way you can do that is forgiveness. Forgiveness allows joy to grow and thrive in your relationship. Without forgiveness, any relationship is doomed. And I know some of you have been hurt deeply by spouses. I'm not saying that forgiveness is easy because it's not. It's not even quick. It is a process that takes commitment every single day. And you may need help. You may need to go see a counselor. You may need to talk to a pastor. Our prayer team's here at the front. They can help you pray for that. You, you may need to show up Monday night for Celebrate Recovery. Did I mention that we have it at 6.30 in this room? Uh, but if you want a healthy, intimate relationship, forgiveness is essential. So forgive every day. And then, of course, if you want to have healthy intimacy, you need to touch often. Uh, do I need to read 1 Corinthians 7 again? I mean, with, with emphasis added. Hey, look, I'm just going to read verse 5 again. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Those are the words of the Apostle Paul. Those are the words that God wants us to hear when it comes to intimacy. And it should be obvious that intimacy involves touching. Paul warns us about the dangers of depriving spouses of sexual contact and physical touch. By the way, a healthy marriage involves a mutually satisfying sex life and an abundance of non-sexual touching as well. I see there should be an amen for both sides on that one. It's not one or the other. It needs both to be healthy. It needs both to be healthy. 
I mean, if you're going to be intimate, then you, it needs to be intimate all the time, not just a few, you know, moments uh, in, of the day and then the rest of the time. No, it's, this is about loving each other in completely. So um, couples, talk about this openly and honestly and gently. Because remember, we talked about gentle communication. This is your challenge for the week. I'm just going to challenge you. If you're married, have a date night this week. Dare to ask the question, are you satisfied with our sex life? Do we touch, do, you know, uh, often enough outside of sex and listen to each other and learn from each other and forgive each other and decide together what your life you want it to look like? Because if you do that, you'll discover a growing trust and joy and healthy intimacy fills your life and your marriage. After all, God created sex to bless us. If we're following Jesus, well, your marriage is gonna be blessed if you live your life his way. Let's pray. Father, your gifts for us and to us are good. And we thank you for the way that you've chosen to bless us. So often we don't even recognize your blessings in our lives. And so God, we just confess that and ask your grace at that point. God, and so often we take the, the beautiful gifts that you give us and, and we treat them like they were play toys. And we repent. We ask that you would forgive us. We ask that you would cleanse us. We ask that you would help us to be the men and women of God that you created us to be, whether we are married or single, uh, widowed, divorced. Uh, God, whatever place we find ourselves in life, we want to represent you well. So give us grace. Let your spirit inhabit our hearts and our lives. Let us hear his voice. And, and Father, help us to obey. Help us to build our lives on your word because you love us and you've demonstrated that love in Jesus. And Father, for our marriages, I pray especially that, that you would bless the couples that are here, the couples that are joining us online, that, that they would sense your love in their life and they would grow in love for each other so that we can have homes that point people to the Son of God and Savior of the world, who is Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening. I hope today's message provided insight into God's plan for marriage and intimacy. He could have made our reproductive process like that of the flowers, but instead, God chose to bless us. It's just one more sign of His love for us. We want to get to know you and have a series of virtual meetings scheduled for that purpose. I invite you to visit calvaryaz.com forward slash events and click on the community connections graphic to learn more and sign up. I really hope you will. Well, that's all for now. Have a great week. Bye-bye.